It was just delightful. He is the founder and master of the turn of the century electrotherapy museum. He's collected and had experience with over 250 old Tesla coils. You don't get more practical than this. He really knows what he's doing with this. He is based in West Palm Beach, Florida, originally from Pittsburgh, and we had a nice conversation about the Ruthenian community in Pittsburgh, which he's not a part of. And so I'm going to just simply welcome Jeff Bahari to our conference this morning. Thank you. My name's Jeff Bihari, and today we're gonna talk about installing new toilets. Uh, this is a wax toilet seal, and believe it or not, it's one of the handiest components in making turn-of-the-century Tesla coils, but later. Uh, which one is advanced to the right, I think? I have to figure out how to use the technology here. Going wireless. Yeah, testing, testing. Test again? Testing, 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 testing. Okay. Testing, testing, Tesla testing. Okay. All right. Now the right button is advanced. Oops, that was my fault, sorry. <laughs> Use the left button. Left button's advanced? Yeah. Okay. Left button's page down, and the right button's page. See if that sense. Maybe. It's a new slideshow. There you are. All right. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right, this is the Turn of Century Electrotherapy Museum. It's relatively new. It's in West Palm Beach. We just moved from Fort Lauderdale, which was in headache. We had the biggest rider trucks you could find filled with coils and x-ray tubes and glass plate negatives and you name it. But in this museum, uh, it's mainly about collecting original Tesla and Tesla related items. Um, Hold on, let's see you here. Okay. Still feedback. Okay. Testing, testing. That, that sounds better. better. Okay. okay. Uh, to the left here, you see some of the earliest surviving Tesla coils. Go ahead, don't try it. And uh, they're housed in a glass case. They were found, uh, we spoke about this during last year's lecture. They were found in Boston. They're one of Tesla's contemporaries, Thomas Burton Kinraid. They were built um, from 1896 to 1901, and they were actually coils that uh, had burned out in part, some of them during use, that he had had left in his laboratory for repairs. And we come along 110 years later and found them. And to the right, there's uh, some of our books and x-ray tubes. We've got about 100 original books on Tesla technologies from the 1880s up until the 20s and 30s. And quite a lot of manuals and smaller quackery related items, uh, violet ray books and that sort of thing. Okay, it's not advancing. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Yeah, this was the man Kinraid. Uh, just a quick note on him. We have 500 glass plate negatives that he had made of electric discharges, and he's relatively unknown. He invented the first portable x-ray machine that uses the same technologies as seen in, in these early Tesla coils we're gonna talk about today. Um, he had lived in Jamaica Plain, Boston, and if it wasn't for him, a lot of people wouldn't have had experience on the commercial side of things with Tesla coils. And shortly after that, there was an explosion probably in the early part of the century up into the teens and 20s, all the violet ray machines, there were tens of thousands made 
but probably the first original coils and the people that developed these machines actually experienced some of his work because Tesla's coils themselves weren't actually marketed to, to any extent. So the practical experience people obtained other than seeing his lectures were through the few early machines that were manufactured. Here's an example of one of those negatives. Um, it was made with a Tesla coil simply by touching a, a glass plate that had photoemulsion on it. And the, as the spark would spread over the plate, it left an imprint of what it looked like. And basically, that, that's one of them, what they look like. Um, the amazing variants in these are incredible. Um, there are dozens of types of discharges, such as the ones Tesla went over in his lectures, that can be seen in some of these plates. And if you ever have the chance to go to South Florida, you can have a look through them. Um, these were the, the, some of the early Tesla coils in that case. Um, most of these are between seven and eight inches in diameter. They look different than what most people think of as Tesla coils, but um, as this lecture will, will point out, the original coils Tesla used weren't the tall magnifying type coils like Colorado Springs. They were little tabletop models. And these are examples of, of some of those. The other thing we have at the museum is interesting is there's a company that just went out of business within the year called H.G. Fisher. And we have around 3,000 blueprints original to that company. And they manufactured Tesla coils for medical use. And what's interesting about this company is that none of the machines they made were ever banned by the FDA or AMA. They were all completely legitimate as far as the authorities were concerned. And most of the time, they all had spark gaps. They were all Tesla coils. And the secret to that is that they never went with extraordinary claims for any of their machines. They tried to publish the truth about them. And they made violet rays, and they made spark gap surgical diathermy machines, x-ray machines, all based on Tesla technologies. They even had AC generators that were used for muscle stimulation. And one of the only companies, well, the only company to last 100 years, um, they just went out of business. In the end, they were just making x-ray machines for um, mammography. And, uh, but when they started out, they had a whole line of hundreds of different types of machines. Um, to the left, you can see a blueprint of um, a twin Tesla system. I have the system. and. It's one of the most efficient Tesla coils I've ever seen, and I'm quite certain that uh, it's as close to these Tesla coils as you can get as far as the output of it. This thing will produce with 25 watts of electricity the same effect as you can see in the, the famous Kelvin photo. And with 10 or 15 amps, you, you produce a flaming arc that can, the heat can be felt three or four feet away from it. Uh, to the right, there's a surgical machine, and below is one of the early x-ray machines. These are some of the early books. Uh, they don't look like much, but these days they're five, six hundred dollars each to actually get one, and there's very few surviving copies. Um, let's see if I can point it out here. This, for example, is a first edition Tesla. Uh, runs for about fifteen hundred bucks a copy if you actually find one. Uh, it's one of his lectures. And what's interesting about that book, someone had a page mark in it of his obituary from uh, when he died. So someone, whoever owned the book, really was, was fond of Tesla and, and uh, kept up with things. Um, yeah, there's the cover of that one. But in all of these early books, it's usually when you find some of this early material, because much of it hasn't been published. Um, these Tesla coils in the first poster here were actually um, from one of these books. And uh, this mercury interrupter on the end, I've never seen published anywhere else. So if it wasn't for the old books and some of the old authors, and many of them were friends with Tesla or, or had met him at one point, a lot of the information we wouldn't have today. Um, this is kind of an introduction to this. It's um, a letter that actually wasn't allowed to be published. Someone went to the Tesla Museum and illegally photographed it for me. I don't know who because I received it anonymously. But um, 
It's from Sir William Crookes, as, as many of you will know. And it says, my dear Tesla, you're a true prophet. I finished my new coil and it doesn't do so well as the little one you made for me. I fear it's too large. Now I must get to the right angle to read it. Uh, I have fitted it with two sets of Leiden jars, six quart jars on each side, but the spark is not long or thin and there's scarcely any brush to be seen. The phosphorescence through my body when I hold one terminal is decidedly inferior to that to the little, that given with the little one. I'm actuating it only with the ordinary make and break of the large coil as the alternator is not yet here. I do not think I've made any mistake in the winding of the coil as your coil does just the same as mine. And it's funny to know that one of the pioneers in the x-ray field couldn't even build a proper Tesla coil compared to Tesla's and what's interesting about this is that uh, he received an original Tesla coil and imagine the, the, the possibilities of this, one of the two of the, the greatest people of our times talking back and forth about making Tesla coils and trying to get it right and we're still trying to do this years later. Uh, these are some effects that I've taken that can be done with these type of coils. Uh, to the left you see the effluves created from just a single wire and to the right you see a halo effect. And what's interesting with these early make and break type systems, you get spark discharges that are a little bit different than what you normally see. And they tend to be branching, they tend to be defined a little bit differently than what we think of as a normal spark. The article here uh, that I'm presenting, it took 10 years to find. And believe it or not, uh, it's hard to see at the bottom of this magazine cover, it says there are 125,000 copies published. And right now I know of only three copies that still exist. I'm, I'm sure it's around somewhere else, but 10 years later I've only been able to track down one of them. The other one's at the Tesla Museum and the other one Harry Goldman has. But this was the only time this information was published aside from 1956, the Tesla Museum published the article in one of their books, but for some reason the photos didn't always line up with the article. They made some changes when they published it and I'm not quite sure why, but this is the original. And it's interesting, it comes 1919, it was in the middle of when Tesla was doing the My Invention series from Electrical Experimenter. So it's right in the middle of everything that was famous being published and that we see in a lot of today's books, but for some reason it's not been published again since and I, I don't understand why because it's the most important article I think he's ever written concerning his coils. Um, he wrote it 20 years after he made most of the coils and one of the reasons is there were so many coils being marketed at that time using his name and curious enough on one of the pages uh, we can point it out over here. There's a violet ray ad and they have the nerve to say that it was developed by Nikola Tesla but perfected by Anthony Longoria <laughs> to extents never been achieved before. And I think this is exactly one of the reasons Tesla published this now because he said in the beginning of the article that there are coils being marketed that none of them can be improved upon. 20, well, there's coils marketed today, and this is in the 20s, 1919, that were made 20 years ago and that kept, could not be improved upon then. And I would extend that statement to today actually because these are grounds that no one's really experimented with. And everyone has sort of dabbled with Tesla coils, but no one's really made the originals and all the information has been here the whole time. Uh, this was the, the photos from that medical book. Um, the first two photos you can see occasionally in articles, but the last one I've, I've never seen. And that's a mercury interrupter. It's from one of his um, circuit controller patents from September um, 1898. I'm going to go back and forth with this article just because Tesla wrote it, it was really wonderful. Um, Hugo Gernsback wrote the introduction 
It says, Mr. Tesla makes a very important contribution to the electrical arts with this article. The pioneer of all high frequency apparatus divulges much that is new and startling in these pages. Few people realize the enormous value of Mr. Tesla's machines and the many different important uses to which they can be applied in our everyday lives. New and startling uses are being found every year for these machines. It's characteristic of Mr. Tesla that he's actually developed and built an astounding variation of these machines and, and we regret that we can publish only a very few of the more important models. Most of the Tesla coils shown have never been published. And as Tesla starts off, few fields have been opened up, the exploration of which has proved as fruitful as that of high frequency currents. Their singular properties and the spectacular character of the phenomenon they presented immediately commanded universal attention. Scientific men became interested in their investigation, engineers were attracted by their commercial possibilities, and physicians recognized in them a long sought means for an effective treatment of bodily ills. Since the publication of my first research is in 1891, Hundreds of volumes have been written on the subject and many invaluable results obtained through the medium of this new agency. Yet the art is only in its infancy and the future has incomparably bigger things in store. From the very beginning, I felt the necessity of producing efficient apparatus to meet a rapidly growing demand and during eight years succeeded my original announcements, I developed not less than 50 types of these transformers or electrical oscillators, each complete in every detail and refined to such a degree that I could not materially improve upon any one of them today. Had I been guided by practical considerations, I might have built up an immense and profitable business, incidentally rendering important services to the world. But the force of circumstances and the ever enlarging vista of greater achievements turned my efforts in other directions. And so it comes that instruments will shortly be placed on the market which, oddly enough, were perfected 20 years ago. This is a classic example of, of, of one of these Tesla coils. They look a bit different from the ones we see today. Um, the main components you can see are a condenser which is actually hidden in the wooden base, a self-induction coil which is nothing more than an electromagnet. Uh, that's seen in the front of the unit. A circuit controller which can be as simple as an electromagnetic interrupter or as complicated as a rotary mercury interrupter. And basically oscillation transformer which is the Tesla coil itself. These oscillators are expressly intended to operate on direct and alternating currents and to generate damped and undamped oscillations or currents of any frequency, volume and tension within the widest limits. They're compact, self-contained, require no care for long periods of time and will be found very convenient and useful for various purposes as wireless telegraphy and telephony, conversions of electrical energy, formation of chemical compounds through fusion and combination, synthesis of gases, manufacture of ozone, lighting, welding, municipal, hospital and domestic sanitation and sterilization, and numerous other applications in scientific laboratories and industrial institutions. While these instruments have never been described before, the general principles underlying them were fully set forth in my published articles and patents, more particularly those of September 22, 1896. Broadly, the instruments are divided into two classes and this article has first a section of eight instruments which have mechanical make and breaks or circuit controllers and the second class has mercury interrupters and it's basically a, a liquid form of make and break and uh, the idea of mercury interrupters were used before but mainly for induction coils and for special types of x-ray machines. Uh, they were pretty crude when compared to Tesla's. Uh, to the left you see one of the, the few surviving models. This is not a, a Tesla build item, but it was actually from Gaif Galot, an x-ray company in France. This is the, the first uh, oscillator mentioned in this article. Many of these I've done 3D CAD renderings of. Uh, these are just images here, but uh, I've taken from the original drawings and, and made uh, 
conceptualized uh, machines based on these ideas. And any of these components, uh, I've generated blueprints for. Some of them I've made, some of them I haven't been able to yet. But uh, this image exists in a, th a three dimensional form. You can see through parts, you can pull off pieces of wood and take measurements from them. Uh, they're not exact to what Tesla was doing because I could only go on guessing, uh, measuring nuts and bolts so that I would know what size they were. But that's basically what I designed the rest of the components off of. And this is the first uh, coil in his article. In figure one is shown one of the earliest forms of oscillator constructed for experimental purposes. The condenser is contained in a square box of mahogany upon which is mounted the self-induction or charging coil. Wound as will be noted in two sections connected in multiple or series according to whether the tension of the supply circuit is 110 or 220 volts. From the box protrude four brass columns carrying a plate with the spring contacts and adjusting screws as well as two massive terminals for the transformer. Two of the columns serve as condenser connections while the other pair is employed to join the binding posts of the switch in front of the self-induction coil and condenser. The primary coil consists of a few turns of copper ribbon to the ends of which are soldered short rods fitting to the terminals referred to. The secondary is made in two parts wound in a manner to reduce as much as possible distributed capacity and at the same time enable the coil to withstand a very high pressure between which its terminals at the center are connected to binding posts on two rubber columns projecting from the primary. The operation is as follows. When the switch is thrown on, the current from the supply circuit rushes through the self-induction coil, magnetizing the iron core with <clears throat> within and separating the contacts of the controller. The high tension induced current then charges the condenser and upon closure of the contacts, the accumulated energy is released through the primary giving rise to a long series of oscillations which excite the tuned secondary circuit. The device has proved highly serviceable in carrying on laboratory experiments of all kind. For instance, in studying the phenomenon of impedance, the transformer was removed and a bent copper bar inserted into the terminals. This is what you see to the left. The latter was often replaced by a large circular loop to exhibit inductive effects at a distance or to excite resonant circuits used in various investigations and measurements. A transformer suitable for any desired performance could be readily improvised and attached to the terminals and in this way much time and labor was saved. Contrary to what might be naturally expected, little trouble was experienced with the contacts although the current through them was heavy, namely proper conditions of resonance existing. The great flow occurs only when the circuit is closed and no destructive arcs can develop. Originally, I employed platinum and iridium tips, but later replaced them with some of meteorite and finally tungsten. The last have given the best satisfaction, permitting working for hours and days without interruption. So, the power would, would come into this through the front and there were some uh, circuiting, short circuiting bars, much like industrial control transformers have, where you just put the windings in series or parallel, depending on if it was 110 or 220. And this was wired up to the series of induction coils here. Now, these were either in series or in parallel, depending on the supply voltage. So it, it's not really a transformer, it's a single winding of wire, which can be thought of as a single winding of wire. In the middle of, of this self-induction coil, there are iron wires which were used for the core. And these would become magnetized as it's an electromagnet. And above that is a circuit controller, an interrupter. And basically there was a piece of steel on the end of a piece of copper. And there was a tungsten contact mounted. And as the coil was energized, it would simply pull this down and break the circuit. And since the tungsten contacts would separate, the circuit would become dead. But the magnetism in the coil uh, still was there. And as this collapsing field of the electromagnet occurred, it induced a high voltage current through the coil. And this high voltage was then used to charge a condenser in the base, which discharged across either the high frequency loop or the two pancake coils over here as soon as the, the contacts were closed again.
going on the figure two, illustrates a small oscillator designed for certain specific uses. The underlying idea was to attain great activities during minute intervals of time, each succeeded by a comparatively long period of inaction. With this object, a large self-induction and quick acting brake were employed, owing to which arrangement the condenser was charged to a very high potential. Sudden secondary currents and sparks of great volume were thus obtained, eminently suitable for welding thin wires, flashing lamp filaments, igniting explosive mixtures, and kindred applications. The instrument was also adapted for battery use, and in this form was a very effective igniter for gas engines on which a patent bearing number 609250 was granted to me on August 16, 1898. Um, this photo to the right is actually the picture shown in the 1950 Tesla Museum version. Um, evidently, it's a, just a larger version of, of this type of ignition coil, which was published in 1919. Uh, I think the effects are exactly the same. Here you can see a, a rendering of this. Uh, it it's actually it would be an easy coil to build for anyone. The, the top has, uh, would have had two disruptive discharge coils similar to this, which were used in the violet ray machines. And with these type of coils, if, if you know the violet rays, they make like a one inch spark. You can easily ignite gas circuits with them, uh, like a propane, for instance. And for lighting actual um, uh, gasoline, petrol, in the combustion engine, you can modify the circuit a little to make a, a more quickly acting brake. And in that case, you'll get a smaller spark, but it'll tend to be the orange you see in like a Model T and that, um, ignition coil, for example. And I'm hoping I have another picture here. I don't remember my own slides. There, there you see to the left, that's just a standard ignition coil from this time period. And to the right is the same rendering I drew with the, I, I drew the, the pictures with pine boxes because the mahogany doesn't show up very well in the photos. Um, but it's about half, half the size of what a Model T coil would be. And yet just as efficient and effective. Uh, down below you see a, a modified uh, form of coil. Uh, this was a modified induction coil operated on Tesla principles. There's no iron core and you can see the type of discharge you can get from one. Moving on to figure three. Uh, figure three represents a large oscillator of the first class intended for wireless experiments, production of Rentgen rays, and scientific research in general. Uh, Rankin rays are x-rays. Uh, it comprised a box containing two condensers of the same capacity on which are supported the charging coil and transformer. The automatic circuit controller, hand switch, and connecting posts are mounted on the front plate of the inductance spool, as is also the contact springs. The condenser box is equipped with three terminals, the two external ones serving merely for connection. Uh, those are hard to see in the photo. But um, the vibrating spring itself, the sole function of which is to cause periodic interruptions, can be adjusted in strength as well as the distance from the iron core in the center of the charging coil and by four screws visible on the top plate so that any desired conditions of mechanical troll, control might be secured. The primary of the transformer, and that's the Tesla coil, is copper sheet and taps are made at various points for varying at will the number of turns. As in figure one, the inductance coil is wound in two sections to adapt the instrument both to 110 and 220 volts and several secondaries were provided to suit the various wavelengths of the primary. The output was approximately 500 watts with damped waves of about 50,000 cycles per second. For short periods of time, undamped oscillations were produced in screwing the vibrating spring tight against the iron core and then separating the contacts by adjusting the screw, which also performed the function of a key. And as the way this works is the current is flowing through this interrupter. By adjusting the tension of it, you can adjust how quickly the condenser is charged and discharged through the coil. And 
the most powerful effects are produced when the little steel armature on the bottom of that copper piece is almost touching the coil. And if you separate it just slightly, it'll vibrate very, very quickly. And the most currents made to flow through the, the system that way because the circuit's closed for the most amount of time. To the left, you see uh, the coil I, I showed the blueprint earlier on. This was a, a Tesla X-ray coil made by H.G. Fisher. And this discharge seen above is actually low power. That's with around 100 watts throwing, flowing through the coil. Below, you can see high power where you get a white flame. And the way this was used to produce X-rays is you, you simply connected an X-ray tube to either end of the terminals and the, the electrons inside a tube were accelerated towards the target. And the stopping of these electrons is what produced the X-rays. Uh, here's a similar system. It was actually made by a company, Victor. Uh, here you can see the original high frequency X-ray tube. There's not many of them still left because they tended to break. This coil here is actually larger than the machine. It's about 22 inches long, has a very high vacuum, and there were plenty of fragile blown glass points around which were known to break and cause the tube to implode and everything else. So there's two or three of them floating around the country. I'm lucky to have one of them. You can see when it's energized, what happens? The glass begins to phosphoresce inside as the electrons are traveling across. And the x-rays are coming out of this section here. Uh, the tube is inverted here, but the target's at an angle. And they come perpendicular from the center of that. Um, the tubes were, would have still been used. They were very efficient. Um, Tesla x-ray coils were some of the only systems at that time to make x-rays of the entire body. You could go straight through the body with them. With the induction coils and static machines, you could easily x-ray the hands or the arms. But once you start go getting the thicker parts of the body, they become blurry because there wasn't enough radiation being produced. With these coils, there was no problem for producing radiation. Um, in fact, some of these systems, you can have uh, your basic x-ray tube here and coil. You can stand about two foot away and behind you you'd have a screen, a uh, fluor fluoroscopy screen. And as the, the tube was energized, the doctor could see your bones on the screen as you moved around. Unfortunately, a lot of physicians died this way because they were being x-rayed in the process each time. But Coolidge come along a few years later and invented the Coolidge tube, which has a heated filament inside. And really, that's the only reason these were phased out, because the invention of the Coolidge tube greatly simplified the apparatus needed. All you need to do is heat that filament up with a few volts, and you could just use a high voltage transformer with much lower voltages to produce the same quality of x-rays. Um, thinking of, of particles today, they use uh, 100,000 volts on average to operate an x-ray tube. The early Tesla systems used 250,000. So the, the, the type of x-rays produced were a little more dangerous in the, te in the Tesla system, but you could make quicker exposures. We're going on to, this is this is the next style system. It's, it's very much similar to the others. Um, this was patent 583953. Uh, on the front of this is a mechanical type of interrupter. Rather than having the contacts, there was a, a brush which rubbed against a wheel. And as you see on this wheel, there's solid, a solid contact going all the way across, and then smaller contacts which, only, uh, which didn't touch. They were only on either side. And the actual brushes of this system were uh, limited to half of that wheel. And what happened is this thing was spinning. It would make and break the circuit of these inductance spools here. And it would charge the capacitors in, in parallel and discharge them in series. So you were able to get a higher voltage to the disruptive discharge coil here. Um, the rest of this, these coils here are simply to operate this motor. 
Um, a lot of the motors uh, were direct current motors at the time. Uh, these, many of these machines were made to operate on either DC or AC. Um, all of the motors in, in the Tesla coils are, of course, Tesla motors also from his, his patents. Uh, here you can see a little better close up from his patent of, of that type of charging wheel. And what was also curious about this unit, the pancake coils, you can wind them in different ways. And um, in all of these coils, there were kind of a drum with the outputs coming out on either side. And the problem with that is there was a huge tendency of these middle windings to want to arc to each other because this was where the highest tension was obtained. And Tesla did something clever here. He just moved the windings outward so that all of this area would be filled with wax. And that the outer windings were nearly at the same potential and they were grounded in the middle. So this sort of open arrangement helped uh, protect the coils and keep them from short circuiting inside. Next to the right, we see the, the famous photo of uh, uh, one of the lecture coils that was uh, demonstrated with, to Lord Kelvin. Um, figure four is a photograph of a type of transformer in every respect similar to the one illustrated in May 1919 of Electrical Experimenter. Uh, this was from July and this was the one published in May. It contained identical essential parts disposed in a like manner but was specially designed for use on supply circuits of higher tension from 220 to 500 volts or more. The usual adjustments are made by setting the contact spring and shifting the iron core within the inductance coil up and down by means of two screws. In order to prevent injury through a short circuit, fuses were also inserted in the lines. Now, if anyone's ever used a violet ray machine, uh, it's the same basic principle. You, you turn this knob and a little set of contactors buzzes inside. And this is actually the coil from one of them. And um, you'll get the discharge at the end. Um, normally, when you break the current from uh, a self-induction coil, and I have one here. You can see it's just a small electromagnet. Uh, generally, you get a, um, a voltage to charge the condenser of around 1,000 to 1,500 volts. Now, you get a much higher voltage at the higher supply circuit lines. So if you run it from 220, you can get a little bit higher spike, or maybe around 2,000 volts. And if you operate it off of um, a 480 line, or a 500 volts line, as I think Tesla said here. Um, it becomes even more interesting because technically a, a 480 line you can use to run a Tesla coil direct. You don't need a transformer. You need the spark gap to be very close, um, maybe one or two thousands max, and it's hard to quench the gap at that kind of voltage because if uh, at 500 volts, instead of dealing with milliamps in the, in the secondary, you're, you're dealing with amps of current. And uh, so you can, you can run a Tesla coil directly from 480 connected to a condenser or spark gap and coil and run it that way. It's very hard to quench the gap. With this type of system, the, you can throw the self-induction coil in and that'll help limit the current through that, through that system. And because there's contacts there already, it'll automatically set the gap for you. I built one coil based on this principle. Um, I couldn't bring it here because someone else is, is exhibiting it somewhere. Um, it's kind of crude compared to Tesla's, but I, I was working, it was before I had a workshop, so I basically built it in the spare bedroom. Uh, you can see the, the self-induction coil here, the interrupters on top, the condensers in the base, and the pancake coils in the back. And this coil was, it's, was interesting. It, it used the same amount of current as a violet ray, only 20, 30 watts or so, but produced enough energy to, to power an x-ray tube for small purposes. You could see the bones of your hand with it, but nothing more. But it still produced a three or four inch spark. Here is a, a slightly larger coil. You can see that the flu effect produced with it. 
and that was with just a wire extended in a circle. But you can see the interesting lighting effects. Tesla went on to, to publish On Light and Other High Frequency Phenomena, it was one of his lectures. And in it, there were, he went to great extents describing how you can uh, light without vacuums. He would have loops of wire and the air would ionize between them. And it's something that nothing was ever really done with, but it's interesting to see that you can actually light a room with just high frequency currents, just the discharges by themselves. Uh, you almost, uh, to use a small amount of current and do that, you need to use the pancake type coils. Uh, figure five was a slightly different type of Tesla coil. It was made to replace the Romkorff coils, which are, are seen on the left here. Um, Romkorff coil or induction coil were, didn't generate high voltages like a Tesla coil. They were normally 20 or 30,000 volts. And here was a Tesla coil he made to do just that. Um, the currents developed in the ladder have a, a tension from 10,000 to 30,000 volts, are used to charge condensers and operate an independent high frequency coil as customary. At the time in Europe, there was uh, Arsen Yarsenval, uh, was experimenting medically with heating people through high frequency currents. And he was basically doing so with just the primary of a Tesla coil. He would connect a rod to either end and someone would hold it and they would feel heat within their body from wherever the currents were generated. Uh, another man came along, Paul Whedon, who found that if you put a solenoid of wire next to this coil and just touched the bottom of it, grounded to somewhere on this winding, you could get a brush discharge from the top which is very similar to a Tesla coil. Um, it isn't a Tesla coil, in, in fact, and as such, but during that time, a lot of people experimented with these kind of uh, coils which operated from other high frequency coils, rather than connecting. They were almost like a magnifying transmitter, in a sense, because it would be a coil that isn't necessarily coupled with the circuit, but that you could attach to it and get a, a disruptive discharge from. And there were flat spirals used for this and these tall solenoids. So there were high frequency coils meant to power other high frequency coils. And this was one example. Uh, next was a, a small coil specifically meant to produce ozone. And um, this was figure six. It's a small version. A smaller version of the coils we've seen previously, the difference is the dischargers are made with plates to ionize the air and it consumed much less voltage. And uh, the idea was not to produce a spark discharge but a silent discharge between the terminals. So as you separated these disks, the air would ionize between them and create a lot of ozone. You can see the basic components again. There's connection to power right here. These were connections to the condenser inside. You have the charging coil, the interrupter, the dischargers, and the two pancake coils in the back. Now, figure seven is another type of Tesla coil. The only difference is that it was made to produce uh, currents of a specific unchanging frequency. And I've tried this before, it's difficult to do. Basically, there's a, a condenser in series with the circuit, in series with the contacts in the coil, but there's also a condenser in parallel with the coil. And basically, you have the two condensers acting together with the, with the frequency of the coil. And they're hard to tune. Um, I'll get into later a little bit, a uh, type of condenser that makes it easier uh, to work with. But next is figure eight. Now this, this is still of the first class. This brake here is a mechanical brake. It doesn't use mercury yet. Uh, the charging inductances are in the form of two long spools upon which are supported the secondary terminals. 
So there's actually an electromagnet down here and this discharger mounted to the top of it. Um, this transformer was used in my wireless experiments and frequently for lighting vacuum tubes and exhibited in the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, here you can see that same coil in action. It's lighting up some of the tubes in his Housen Street lab. Um, there were many invaluable photos like this that are of that laboratory that are hard to find these days. Um, it, since it, it burnt to the ground, there's whatever was published at the time was all we have to go by. This is the first uh, of these series which use mercury. Uh, the interrupters, it's motor driven and it's in the front. And well, let's stick to his description here. Um, it consists of a motor driven hollow pulley containing a small quantity of mercury which is thrown outwardly against the walls of a vessel by centrifugal force and entrains a contact wheel which periodically closes and opens the condenser circuit. By means of adjusting screws above the pulley, the depth and immersion of the veins and consequently the dura duration of each contact can be varied at desire. This form of brake is given thorough satisfaction working continuously with currents of from 20 to 25 amperes. The number of interruptions is usually from 500 to 1000 per second and the space occupied is about 10 inches by 8 inches by 10 inches. That's an incredible statement about the amount of power that can go through this. Normal tungsten contacts, you're limited to about two or three amps maximum going through them before they start to heat up or fuse together. Here he was using mercury and running 20 to 25 amps from 110 circuit. So it's a kilowatt of power just using a make and break. Uh, he did form a patent to this. Uh, you can see on the left some internal views. And I've went into a little bit of detail with this. This can here is about the size of a cat food can. And it's spinning around and if you think of the effect in a blender, when you switch on the blender, all the liquid goes up to the sides because there's um, the chopper in the bottom spinning. The same effect happens if you spin the container by itself with liquid inside. The liquid will go to the outside by centrifugal force. And basically there's a fan, which is a little hard to see. And I have detailed pictures of all of this. Um, there's a fan that's basically, it, the blades of the fan, it's allowed to move freely. It's on a fixed shaft so that the whole, that assembly doesn't move. But as this cylinder is spinning, it's catching the blades and spinning the blades and the blades periodically make and break contact with the mercury that's on the outside of the can. So that's what's making and breaking the circuit. Here you can see the fan a little better. But it's uh, basically an iron container it's, as it's spinning. This front mechanism is, are the adjusting screws which adjust the height of the fan with respect to the wall of the cylinder. Uh, this part remains stationary because of this brass rod going through. The only thing that spins is this can. And the mercury can be seen at the very bottom. And the can is kind of formed on the inside so that the mercury is directed more or less in one area of it rather than going up the sides in all locations. Uh, here you can see the stationary components. And to help with the make and break, um, this particular break was done in air. It's just a, a cylinder which has been closed by something like a rubber seal around it. And there's a tendency of when the fan blades come out of the mercury of an arc to develop. And to prevent that, he filled the container with paraffin oil, which is kerosene, above the level of mercury. And what happens, it's like mixing oil and vinegar. One floats on top of the other. So as, even as this thing was spinning, it, it didn't quite emulsify like a vinaigrette would but it still separated as the rotation of the cylinder occurred. So as this fan was spinning, as the blades come out of the mercury, the oil would prevent an arc and allow the circuit to be made and broken over and over again. Next he found that he could push the circuit even farther by hermetically sealing these mercury interrupters. And, uh, 
Figure 10 consists of a perforated metal box containing the condenser and charging inductance and carrying on the top a motor driving the brake and a transformer. The mercury brake is of a kind described and operates on the principle of a jet which establishes intermittently contact with a rotating wheel in the interior of the pulley. So another principle of mercury interrupter is the mercury jet. It's basically as the mercury is on the outside of the container, there's a little funnel receptacle which catches some of it, goes through a tube and produces a jet inside and this jet can spin a fan blade that's held stationary and make and break contact with a fan. So it's, it's basically a fan blade which is moved by mercury caused by the container itself spinning. Uh, this is a similar uh, as, as the last Ramkorf coil. Um, a similar oscillator with hermetically enclosed mercury brake. In this machine, the stationary parts of the interrupter in the interior of the pulley were supported on a tube through which was led an insulated wire connecting the one terminal of the brake while the other was in contact with the vessel. Um, in order to make and break the circuits, uh, normally the container was spinning. It had mercury against its wall. This was one leg of the circuit or one of the tungsten contacts to compare it with something mechanical. The other end was normally in the center where all of the mercury was away from due to the rotation. And normally you had to uh, have a, some type of insulator to, to place a rod through which would remain stationary that you could still make contact with the internal parts of this can while it was spinning. Um, it's easier said than done because as, as everything's spinning you still have to maintain an electrical contact. And it's it, these early units he, he basically had something like a slip ring inside. Uh, later he found that if he tilted the interrupter on one side he could put a series of weighted components inside and basically gravity would hold the weight of whatever was stationary inside still so that the can could still spin and leave everything uh, rotating free. Um, in his words, it's similar to what was seen in, in figure 10. Uh, uh, the motor shaft was done away with, the device pumping the mercury being kept in place by gravity as will be more fully explained in another uh, description here. As we go on, here you can see uh, a magnetic circuit. Basically this was a, a core of an electromagnet which helped to hold a, a fan in place as this cylinder was being rotated. You can start to, to see the teeth which would make contact with the mercury as it was spinning. On the bottom are the, the coils which powered the motor and Tesla found if he coupled uh, another set of coils near these, he didn't need the long inductance spools he had in the other system. So basically the, the circuit which controlled the, the coils which controlled the motor would actually act as a transformer on another set of coils which could be used as the charging coils of the circuit. Uh, here's a similar close-up view and I have some color pictures of this one. Uh, here you can see this is a, just a piece of steel which allows this mechanism to be in position as the rest of it is spinning. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, oh, perfect. Thank you. All right. Here we go. Here's a kind of a transparent view of that cylinder where the mercury would jump up to the sides. The fan's located on one side again. And in the cross section you can see all of this remains stationary. And the cylinder itself is spinning. And it's, this is a, simply a shaft, it's like a bearing. And on the other side is this uh, three, three bladed fan that's what makes and breaks contact with the mercury. Next, uh, Tesla found that rather than have um, a mechanical break between, say, uh, a steel fan and a jet of mercury, it would be better if you could make the break between mercury and mercury, that we have two liquid substances. You could get a little bit higher efficiency with that method. And 
to do this, he obtained another patent in which, and it's hard to see here, there's a jet of mercury. The cylinder itself isn't shown here, but the jet of mercury forms along the side of this while it's spinning, goes through the tube and gets projected through here and the force of it causes an insulated fan to rotate. Now that fan could be made of something like mica or solid asbestos, something that, that would be an insulator that could withstand the heat. And the centrifugal action would also cause mercury to flow up in this section. So as this thing was spinning, it was a jet of mercury hitting a j another jet of mercury. And that's what actually formed the, the make and break. It was liquid to liquid. This was a modified type. The, the main difference here is that uh, he would put some coal gas or something inside of the brake to make a more inert environment to protect the mercury. Um, what happens with mercury brakes, um, especially of the other type where it's mercury against a wheel, um, and also especially if you operate it with direct current, there's some electrolysis that occurs and the mercury becomes dirty. And frequently in the earlier induction coil systems, you'd have to take out the mercury and clean it from time to time. So you'd have to strain it through like a cheesecloth and try to get the impurities out. And uh, handling three or four pounds of mercury isn't the safest thing to do. And this coal gas helped prevent that. And strangely enough, there was nothing at all mentioned anywhere in lectures or in articles about the safety of mercury. It was never even brought up in the conversation. So uh, it was very, very casual. Yeah, just take six pounds of mercury, pour it in, pour a, another two pounds of kerosene on top and, and set it spinning and you're good to go. <laughs> and uh, these days we have to worry a little bit about it. One of the things, all of these Tesla coils, a lot of people ask, well, I've never seen a Tesla coil like this. I don't know what's in the drum in the back. This is a cross section of one. It was made by Fisher. And basically I, I cut it in half with a high pressure water jet. And that enabled me to cut the different densities of materials without disturbing them. And what you see is uh, the secondary coils wound in the middle, the primary coils on the outside. And it's very tightly coupled to the center post, and this is where the output would be from. And you see an example of some of the discharges below. Uh, last is uh, another type of circuit controller he patented. It's, it's basically an upright version of the same. Uh, in this one, it's interesting because he took the nozzle concept further, and he took 10 nozzles on one side that would rotate and nine stationary nozzles on the other side. And what happened for every rotation, each one of these nozzles would hit another one that the mercury was flowing through them at least once. So at one revolution, you got 90 makes and breaks. So you can imagine if you're spinning this thing at 3,600 RPM, you're getting thousands of makes and breaks per second. Here you can see as, uh, as one is rotating, there's contact being made. However, immediately afterward, there's no contacts, and then after, you get another one. And the machining involves incredible to, to do this because trying to fit something in a, a six inch can that's two inches tall, you're, you're machining tubes out of steel, which are gonna take mercury, shoot them in the correct directions, make contact where they should, and just the mechanics involved with the design of that is, is incredible because uh, there's not many components, but they all have to be exact in order for it to work. Um, that's another modified version of that. These were a few mercury interrupters that were on the market. They weren't Tesla's types, but they're much more crude compared to Tesla's. Uh, some of them just had a reciprocating motor that would dip a rod in and out of mercury. Uh, the, you're limited to like 30, 40 breaks a second maximum. It, it's, it's like trying to use a reciprocating saw on a cup of mercury and getting some results. Um, they had some crude turbine types, but in most of the types manufactured, rather than the cylinder moving, just the internal parts would spin around. 
And this is more like a blender. You'd have a stationary uh, container and some blades spinning around, causing the mercury to go to the outside. Um, they were very limited into what they could handle and the amount of makes and breaks you could make with them. Um, there's some, a few views of some of the internal parts of some of them. But we only got a few seconds left. Uh, all of these drawings, CAD drawings, I have available and um, along with this lecture that I'll send anyone for a trade. It's based, I'll send it for free, but I'm actually in the process of building most of these and I need raw materials. And that's where the toilet ring comes into play because getting beeswax and rosin and all of the original materials are kind of hard. I can go to the local store and, and buy wax but when you start asking for a hundred toilet rings, they start to look at you kind of funny and <laughs> wonder why. And violin rosin is the other component of the coils, or beeswax and rosin. I have one over here and I can quickly turn on. I'm running out of time. Uh, anyone who, who sends me some materials to make these coils will get the article and the CAD drawings in return. And that's basically my, my concept. It's something for something. Uh, I don't want any money involved. Uh, this is a coil. It's a mechanical make and break of this system. It uses 50 to 75 watts from the wall. And you can see it'll produce around an 8 inch discharge, which is pretty efficient for a Tesla coil. And the coils here, they're of the flat spiral variety. I, I have them side by side just because I've made a lot of these coils and it's, yeah, the ozone <laughs> permeates the air. Um, it's basically a, a flat spiral of wire and there's a certain number of turns in each layer of, of wire in this system. It starts off with about four towards the center and increases to around 32 on the outside. And depending on all the types of systems I've experimented with here, sometimes these secondary coils can have as little as one or 200 turns of wire. It's not like the, the typical coil which has a, a thousand turns of wire in the secondary and, and 10 in the primary. Here you can get away with almost a four to one ratio on the turns or five to one. Um, in all cases, it's insulated heavily with this wax and rosin. Uh, the only other method is oil. Wax is the, the best system to use because you can keep it liquid a long time. Today there's resins and things that you can mix up, but normally the cure time on them is, is pretty quick. And with this type of system, you can, I, I melt the wax and rosin by induction, throw it in the coil and then keep it hot for a few hours to get all the air out any amount of air in these coils will destroy them instantly. And there's a, a patent probably everyone's seen of Tesla's which was um, a system of manufacturing coils and condensers. It was basically a wax impregnation chamber. And that's really what you need in order to make a lot of this stuff work. And uh, the coils, I have a few dozen original machines from that time period from Fisher and others. And the, the discharges are incredible in, in comparison to most modern Tesla coils. And today people are looking for ways of improving Tesla coils, but they don't actually understand the original coils, and me included. Um, until you start experimenting with these circuits and seeing what efficiencies can be obtained, there's no real sense in trying to improve upon them, at least in my opinion. You have to understand what was there to begin with in order to, to go upon changing anything. And part of the excitement in this article is to actually one by one go through and build some of these and, and see the results. And down in Florida we have a turn of the century machine shop as part of the house the museum where we have a lot of the early tools used to make this type of equipment. And uh, I'd like to think in the, the years to come each year we can demonstrate a different type of one of these coils. And, um, we don't make any money at the museum. We're just hoping to get raw materials, trades, anything people are willing to donate to us, we'll donate something back like this type of information. We've got books on CDs and uh, 
a website which anyone can access, electrotherapymuseum.com. It's two gigabytes and um, right now I think 60,000 files and it's all information contained within the museum. It's nothing that's been published elsewhere. And it's the original materials on electrotherapeutics and Tesla apparatus such as this. There's a lot of early articles and obscure stuff that's offered for free. And the hardest thing is to actually get people to do anything with it. So if, if everyone would try their next Tesla coil building something like this, something like a pancake coil, then, then with each new coil we learn more and more. So. I'll be taking questions afterwards. I don't know, we're probably running low on time. Well, sir, you've got about five minutes. You can either entertain guests down front or uh, question and answer. What's uh, your pleasure? I would say entertain people down here if they want to come see anything Okay, up close. Uh, I tell you what, at this time we'll uh, adjourn for break. We'll be back at 9.30 with Oliver Nicholson. Uh, and Jeff Bahari will entertain for about five or eight minutes before Oliver gets starts uh, personal questions downstairs. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. It was just delightful. He is the founder and master of the turn of the century electrotherapy museum. He's collected and had experience with over 250 old Tesla coils. You don't get more practical than this. He really knows what he's doing with this. He is based in West Palm Beach, Florida, originally from Pittsburgh, and we had a nice conversation about the Ruthenian community in Pittsburgh, which he's not a part of. And so I'm going to just simply welcome Jeff Bahari to our conference this morning. Thank you. My name's Jeff Bihari, and today we're going to talk about installing new toilets. Uh, this is a wax toilet seal, and believe it or not, it's one of the handiest components in making turn-of-the-century Tesla coils, but later. Uh, which one is advanced? To the right, I think. I have to figure out how to use the technology here. Wireless. Yeah, testing, testing. Test again? Testing, 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 testing. Okay. Testing, testing, Tesla testing. Okay. All right. Now the right button is advanced. Oops. That was my fault. Sorry. <laughs> I used the left button. Left button's advanced? Yeah. Okay. Left button's page down, and the right button's page down. Maybe. There you are. All right. Hey, there we go. All right. This is the Turn of Century Electrotherapy Museum. It's relatively new. It's in West Palm Beach. We just moved from Fort Lauderdale, which was a headache. We had the biggest rider trucks you could find filled with coils and x-ray tubes and glass plate negatives and you name it. But in this museum, uh, it's mainly about collecting original Tesla and Tesla-related items. Um, Hold on, let's see you here. Okay. Still feedback. Okay. Testing, testing. That sounds better. Okay. Uh, to the left here, you see some of the earliest surviving Tesla coils. Go ahead. Don't try it. And uh, they're housed in a glass case. They were found, uh, we spoke about this during last year's lecture. They were found in Boston. They're one of Tesla's contemporaries, Thomas Burton Kinraid. They were built um, from 1896 to 1901. 
and they were actually coils that uh, had burned out in part, some of them during use, that he had had left in his laboratory for repairs. And we come along 110 years later and found them. And to the right, there's uh, some of our books and x-ray tubes. We've got about 100 original books on Tesla technologies from the 1880s up until the 20s and 30s. And quite a lot of manuals and smaller quackery-related items, uh, violet ray books and that sort of thing. Okay, it's not advancing. <laughs> Okay, there we go. Yeah, this was the man Kinraid. Uh, just a quick note on him. We have 500 glass plate negatives that he had made of electric discharges. And he's relatively unknown. He invented the first portable x-ray machine that uses the same technologies as seen in, in these early Tesla coils we're going to talk about today. Um, he lived in Jamaica Plain, Boston. And if it wasn't for him, a lot of people wouldn't have had experience on the commercial side of things with Tesla coils. And shortly after that, there was an explosion probably in the early part of the century up into the teens and 20s, all the violet ray machines. There were tens of thousands made. But probably the first original coils and the people that developed these machines actually experienced some of his work because Tesla's coils themselves weren't actually marketed to, to any extent. So the practical experience people obtained, other than seeing his lectures, were through the few early machines that were manufactured. Here's an example of one of those negatives. Um, it was made with a Tesla coil simply by touching a, a glass plate that had photoemulsion on it. And the, as the spark would spread over the plate, it left an imprint of what it looked like. And basically, that, that's one of them, what they look like. Um, the amazing variants in these are incredible. Um, there are dozens of types of discharges, such as the ones Tesla went over in his lectures, that can be seen in some of these plates. And if you ever have the chance to go to South Florida, you can have a look through them. Um, these were the, the, some of the early Tesla coils in that case. Um, most of these are between seven and eight inches in diameter. They look different than what most people think of as Tesla coils, but um, as this lecture will, will point out, the original coils Tesla used weren't the tall magnifying type coils like Colorado Springs. They were little tabletop models. And these are examples of, of some of those. The other thing we have at the museum that's interesting is there's a company that just went out of business within the year called H.G. Fisher. And we have around 3,000 blueprints original of that company. And they manufactured Tesla coils for medical use. And what's interesting about this company is that none of the machines they made were ever banned by the FDA or AMA. They were all completely legitimate as far as the authorities were concerned. And most of the time, they all had spark gaps. They were all Tesla coils. And the secret to that is that they never went with extraordinary claims for any of their machines. They tried to publish the truth about them. And they made violet rays, and they made spark gap surgical diathermy machines, x-ray machines, all based on Tesla technologies. They even had AC generators that were used for muscle stimulation. And one of the only companies, well, the only company to last 100 years, um, they just went out of business. In the end, they were just making x-ray machines for um, mammography, and, uh, but when they started out, they had a whole line of hundreds of different types of machines. Um, to the left, you can see a blueprint of um, a twin Tesla system. I have the system, and it's one of the most efficient Tesla coils I've ever seen, and I'm quite certain that uh, it's as close to these Tesla coils as you can get as far as the output of it. This thing will produce with 25 watts of electricity the same effect as you can see in the, the famous Kelvin photo. And with 10 or 15 amps, you, you produce a flaming arc that can, the heat can be felt three or four feet away from it. Uh, to the right, there's a surgical machine, and below is one of the early x-ray machines. These are some of the early books. Uh, 
They don't look like much, but these days they're five, six hundred dollars each to actually get one. And there's very few surviving copies. Um, let's see if I can point it out here. This, for example, is a first edition Tesla. Uh, runs for about fifteen hundred bucks a copy if you actually find one. Uh, it's one of his lectures. And what's interesting about that book, someone had a page mark in it of his obituary from uh, when he died. So someone, whoever owned the book, really was, was fond of Tesla and, and uh, kept up with things. Um, yeah, there's the cover of that one. But in all of these early books, is usually when you find some of this early material, because much of it hasn't been published. Um, these Tesla coils in the first poster here were actually um, from one of these books. And uh, this mercury interrupter on the end, I've never seen published anywhere else. So if it wasn't for the old books and some of the old authors, and many of them were friends with Tesla or, or had met him at one point, a lot of the information we wouldn't have today. Um, this is kind of an introduction to this. It's um, a letter that actually wasn't allowed to be published. Someone went to the Tesla Museum and illegally photographed it for me. I don't know who because I received it anonymously. But um, it's from Sir William Crookes, as, as many of you will know. And it says, my dear Tesla, you're a true prophet. I finished my new coil and it doesn't do so well as the little one you made for me. I fear it's too large. Now I must get to the right angle to read it. Uh, I have fitted it with two sets of Leiden jars, six quart jars on each side, but the spark is not long or thin, and there's scarcely any brush to be seen. The phosphorescence through my body when I hold one terminal is decidedly inferior to that to the little, that given with the little one. I'm actuating it only with the ordinary make and break of the large coil as the alternator is not yet here. I do not think I've made any mistake in the winding of the coil, as your coil does just the same as mine. And it's funny to know that one of the pioneers in the x-ray field couldn't even build a proper Tesla coil <laughs> compared to Tesla's. And what's interesting about this is that uh, he received an original Tesla coil. And imagine the, the, the possibilities of this, one of the two of the, the greatest people of our times talking back and forth about making Tesla coils and trying to get it right. And we're still trying to do this years later. Uh, these are some effects that I've taken that can be done with these type of coils. Uh, to the left, you see the effluves created from just a single wire. And to the right, you see a halo effect. And what's interesting with these early make and break type systems, you get spark discharges that are a little bit different than what you normally see. And they tend to be branching, they tend to be defined a little bit differently than what we think of as a normal spark. The article here um, that I'm presenting, it took 10 years to find. And believe it or not, uh, it's hard to see at the bottom of this magazine cover, it says there are 125,000 copies published. And right now I know of only three copies that still exist. I'm, I'm sure it's around somewhere else, but 10 years later, I've only been able to track down one of them. The other one's at the Tesla Museum, and the other one Harry Goldman has. But this was the only time this information was published. Aside from 1956, the Tesla Museum published the article in one of their books, but for some reason, the photos didn't always line up with the article. They made some changes when they published it, and I'm not quite sure why. But this is the original. And it's interesting, it comes 1919. It was in the middle of when Tesla was doing the My Invention series from Electrical Experimenter. So it's right in the middle of everything that was famous being published and that we see in a lot of today's books. But for some reason, it's not been published again since. And I, I don't understand why, because it's the most important article I think he's ever written concerning his coils. Um, he wrote it. 20 years after he made most of the coils. And one of the reasons is there were so many coils being marketed at that time using his name. And curious enough, on one of the pages, uh, we can point it out. 
over here, there's a violet rayad, and they have the nerve to say that it was developed by Nikola Tesla, but perfected by Anthony Longoria <laughs> to extents never been achieved before. And I think this is exactly one of the reasons Tesla published this now, because he said in the beginning of the article that there are coils being marketed that none of them can be improved upon. 20, well, there's coils marketed today, and this is in the 20s, 1919, that were made 20 years ago and that kept, could not be improved upon then. And I would extend that statement to today, actually, because these are grounds that no one's really experimented with. And everyone has sort of dabbled with Tesla coils, but no one's really made the originals, and all the information's been here the whole time. Uh, this was the, the photos from that medical book. Um, the first two photos you can see occasionally in articles, but the last one I've, I've never seen. And that's a mercury interrupter. It's from one of his um, circuit controller patents from September um, 1898. I'm going to go back and forth with this article, just because Tesla wrote it. It was really wonderful. Um, Hugo Gernsback wrote the introduction. It says, Mr. Tesla makes a very important contribution to the electrical arts with this article. The pioneer of all high frequency apparatus divulges much that is new and startling in these pages. Few people realize the enormous value of Mr. Tesla's machines and the many different important uses to which they can be applied in our everyday lives. New and startling uses are being found every year for these machines. It's characteristic of Mr. Tesla that he's actually developed and built an astounding variation of these machines, and, and we regret that we can publish only a very few of the more important models. Most of the Tesla coils shown have never been published. And as Tesla starts off, few fields have been opened up, the exploration of which has proved as fruitful as that of high frequency currents. Their singular properties and the spectacular character of the phenomenon they presented immediately commanded universal attention. Scientific men became interested in their investigation, engineers were attracted by their commercial possibilities, and physicians recognized in them a long sought means for an effective treatment of bodily ills. Since the publication of my first researches in 1891, Hundreds of volumes have been written on the subject and many invaluable results obtained through the medium of this new agency. Yet the art is only in its infancy and the future has incomparably bigger things in store. From the very beginning, I felt the necessity of producing efficient apparatus to meet a rapidly growing demand and during eight years succeeded my original announcements, I developed not less than 50 types of these transformers or electrical oscillators, each complete in every detail and refined to such a degree that I could not materially improve upon any one of them today. Had I been guided by practical considerations, I might have built up an immense and profitable business, incidentally rendering important services to the world. But the force of circumstances and the ever enlarging vista of greater achievements turned my efforts in other directions. And so it comes that instruments will shortly be placed on the market, which, oddly enough, were perfected 20 years ago. This is a classic example of, of, of one of these Tesla coils. They look a bit different from the ones we see today. Um, the main components you can see are a condenser, which is actually hidden in the wooden base, a self-induction coil, which is nothing more than an electromagnet. Uh, that's seen in the front of the unit. A circuit controller, which can be as simple as an electromagnetic interrupter, or as complicated as a rotary mercury interrupter. And basically, the oscillation transformer, which is the Tesla coil itself. These oscillators are expressly intended to operate on direct and alternating currents, and to generate damped and undamped oscillations or currents of any frequency, volume, and tension within the widest limits. They're compact, self-contained, require no care for long periods of time, and will be found very convenient and useful for various purposes as wireless telegraphy and telephony, conversions of electrical energy, formation of chemical compounds through fusion and combination, synthesis of gases, 
manufacture of ozone, lighting, welding, municipal, hospital, and domestic sanitation and sterilization, and numerous other applications in scientific laboratories and industrial institutions. While these instruments have never been described before, the general principles underlying them were fully set forth in my published articles and patents, more particularly those of September 22nd, 1896. Broadly, the instruments are divided into two classes, and this article has first a section of eight instruments which have mechanical make and breaks or circuit controllers, and the second class has mercury interrupters. And it's basically a, a liquid form of make and break. And uh, the idea of mercury interrupters were used before, but mainly for induction coils and for special types of x-ray machines.